Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace, Part 18, Page 140. Hal Incandenza's first extant written comment on anything even remotely filmic submitted in Mr. Ogilvy's seventh grade Introduction to Entertainment Studies, two terms required, Enfield Tennis Academy, 21 February, in the year of the Purdue Wonder Chicken. Four years after the demise of Dr. James O. Incandenza passed from his life, a submission receiving just a B to B plus, despite overall positive feedback, mostly because its concluding was neither set up by the essay's body nor supported, Ogilvy pointed out, by anything other than subjective intuition and rhetorical flourish. Chief Steve McGarrett of Hawaii Five O and Captain Frank Furillo of Hill Street Blues are useful for seeing how our North American idea of the hero changed from the BS 1970s era of Hawaii Five O to the BS 1980s era of Hill Street Blues. Chief Steve McGarrett is a classically modern hero of action. He acts out. It is what he does. The camera's always on him. He is hardly ever off screen. He has just one case per week. The audience knows what the case is, also knows by the end of Act One, who is guilty. Because the audience knows the truth before Steve McGarrett does, there is no mystery. There is only Steve McGarrett. The drama of Hawaii Five-O is watching the hero in action, watching Steve McGarrett stalk and strut, homing in on the truth. Homing in is the essence of what the classic hero of modern action does. Steve McGarrett is not weighed down by administrative state police chief chores or by females or friends or emotions or any sort of conflicting demands on his attention. His field of action is bare of diverting clutter. Thus, Chief Steve McGarrett single-mindedly acts to refashion a truth the audience already knows into an object of law, justice, modern heroism. In contrast, Captain Frank Furillo is what used to be designated a post-modern hero, viz. a hero whose virtues are suited to a more complex and corporate American era, i.e., a hero of reaction. Captain Frank Furillo does not investigate cases or single-mindedly home in. He commands a precinct. He is a bureaucrat, and his heroism is bureaucratic, with a genius for navigating cluttered fields. In each broadcast episode of Hill Street Blues, Captain Frank Furillo is beset by petty distractions on all sides from the very beginning of Act One. Not one, but eleven complex cases, each with suspects and snitches and investigating officers and angry community leaders and victims' families all clamoring for redress. Hundreds of tasks to delegate, egos to massage, promises to make, promises from last week to keep, two or three copses, domestic troubles, payroll vouchers, duty logs, corruption, to be tempted by and agonized over. A police chief who's a political parody, a hyperactive son, an ex-wife who haunts the frosted glass cubicle that serves as Frank Furillo's office, whereas Steve McGarrett's B.S. 1970s office more closely resembled the libraries of landed gentry, hushed behind two heavy doors and wainscoting in thick tropical oak, plus a coldly attractive public defenderess who wants to talk about did this suspect get Mirandized in Spanish and can Frank stop coming too soon? He came too soon again last night. Maybe he should get into some kind of stress counseling. Plus, all the weekly moral dilemmas and double binds his even-handed bureaucratic heroism gets Captain Frank Furillo into. Captain Frank Furillo of Hill Street Blues is a postmodern hero, a virtuoso of triage and compromise and administration. Frank Furillo retains his sanity, composure, and superior grooming in the face of a barrage of distracting, unheroic demands. 
that would have left Chief Steve McGarrett slumped, unkempt, and chewing his knuckle in administrative confusion. In further contrast to Chief Steve McGarrett, Captain Frank Furillo is really film tight or full front. He is usually one part of a frenetic moving pan by the program's camera. In contrast, Hawaii Five O's camera crew never even used a dolly, favoring a steady tripodic close up on the Garrett's face that today seems more reminiscent of romantic portraiture than film drama. What kind of hero comes after McGarrett's Irish sized modern cowboy? the lone man of action riding lonely herd in paradise. Furillo's is a whole different kind of loneliness. The postmodern hero was a heroic part of the herd, responsible for all of what he is part of, responsible to everyone, his lonely face as placid under pressure as a cow's face. The jut-jawed hero of action, Hawaii Five-O, becomes the mild-eyed hero of reaction, Hill Street Blues a decade later. And, as we have observed thus far in our class, we, as a North American audience, have favored the more stoic, corporate hero of reactive probity ever since. Some might be led to argue trapped in the reactive moral ambiguity of post- and post-postmodern culture. But what comes next? What North American hero can hope to succeed the placid Frank? We await, I predict, the hero of non-action. The catatonic hero, the one beyond calm, divorced from all stimulus, carried here and there across sets by burly extras whose blood sings retrograde aminus. Enormous, electrolysis rash journalist Helen Steepley's only putative published article before beginning her soft profile on Phoenix Cardinal's punter Orin J. Incandenza, and her only putative published article to have anything overtly to do with good old metropolitan Boston, 10 August in the year of the Depend adult undergarment, four years after optical theorist, entrepreneur, tennis, academician, and avant-garde filmmaker James O. Incandenza took his own life by putting his head in a microwave oven. Moment Magazine has learned that the tragic fate of the second North American citizen to receive a Jarvik 9 exterior artificial heart has sadly been kept from the North American people. The woman, a 46-year-old Boston accountant with irreversible restenosis of the heart, responded so well to the replacement of her defective heart with a Jarvik 9 exterior artificial heart that within weeks she was able to resume the active lifestyle she had so enjoyed before stricken pursuing her active schedule with the extraordinary prosthesis portably installed in a stylish Etienne Anier purse. The heart's ventricular tubes ran up to shunts in the woman's arms and ferried life-giving blood back and forth between her living active body and the extraordinary heart in her purse. Her tragic, untimely, and some might say cruelly ironic fate, however, has been the subject of the all-too-frequent needless tragedies buried beneath when they cast the callous misunderstanding of public officials in the negative light of public knowledge. It took the sort of searching and fearless journalistic doggedness readers have come to respect in moment to unearth the tragically negative facts of her fate. The 46-year-old recipient of the Jarvix 9 exterior artificial heart was actively window shopping in Cambridge, Massachusetts fashionable Harvard Square when a transvestite purse snatcher, a drug addict with a criminal record all too well known to public officials bizarrely outfitted in a strapless cocktail dress spike heels, tattered feather boa and auburn wig brutally tore the life sustaining purse from the woman's unwitting grasp the active alert woman gave chase to the purse-snatching woman for as long as she could, plaintively shouting to passers-by the word, Stop her! She stole my heart! On the fashionable sidewalk, crowded with shoppers, reportedly shouting repeatedly, She stole my heart! Stop her! 
in response to her plaintive calls, tragically misunderstanding shoppers and passers-by merely shook their heads at one another, smiling knowingly at what they ignorantly presumed to be yet another alternative lifestyle's relationship gone sour. A duo of Cambridge, Massachusetts patrolmen, whose names are being withheld from moments dogged queries, were publicly heard to passively quip, happens all the time, as the victimized woman staggered frantically past in the wake of the fleet transvestite shouting for help for her stolen heart. That the prosthetic crime victim gave spirited chase for over four blocks before collapsing onto her empty chest is testimony to the impressive capacity of the Jarvix 9 replacement procedure. Was the anonymous comment of a public medical official reached for comment by moment. The drug-crazed purse snatcher informed officials passively speculated may have found even his heart and conscience moved by the life-saving prosthesis the ill-gotten woman's on your purse revealed, which runs on the same rechargeable power cell as an electric man's razor and may well have continued to beat and bleed for a period of time in the rudely disconnected purse. The purse snatcher's response to this conscience appears to have been cruelly striking the Jarvis 9 exterior artificial heart repeatedly with a stone or a small hammer-like tool where its remains were found some hours later behind the historic Boston Public Library in fashionable Copley Square. In medical science's awe-inspiring march forward, however, always doomed to include such tragic incidents of ignorance and callous loss, one might ask, such seems to be the stance of North American officials. If indeed so, the victim's fate is frequently kept from the light of public knowledge. And the facts of the case's outcome? The 46-year-old deceased woman's formerly active alert brain was removed and dissected six weeks later by a Brigham and Women's City of Boston Hospital medical student reportedly so moved by her terse toe tag's account of the victim's heartless fate that he confessed a moment a temporary inability to physically wield the power saw of his assigned task. Alphabetical tally of separistitur, anti-ONAN groups whose opposition to interdependence reconfiguration is designated by RCMP and USOUS as terrorist slash extortionist in character. Q equals Quebecois, E equals environmental, S separatist, V violent, VV extremely violent. Les assassins du Fontule Roland, QSVV. Le Bloc Québécois, QSE. Calgarian, Pro-Canadian Phalanx, EV. Les Filles du Moncon, QE. Les Filles du Papineau, QSV. Le Front de la Libération de la Québec. QSVV. Le Parti Québécois, QSE. Why, though in the early days of interlaces, interneted teleputers that operated off largely the same fiber digital grid as the phone companies, the advent of video telephoning, a.k.a. videophony, enjoyed an interval of huge consumer popularity. Callers thrilled at the idea of phone interfacing, both orally and facially, the little first-generation phone video cameras being too crude and narrow, apertured for anything much more than facial close-ups, on first-generation teleputers that, at that time, were little more than high-tech TV sets, though, of course, they had that little intelligent agent homuncular icon that would appear at the lower right of a broadcast cable program and tell you the time and temperature outside or remind you to take your blood pressure medication, or alert you to a particularly compelling entertainment option now coming up on channel like 491 or something, or, of course, now alerting you to an incoming video phone call and then tap dancing with little iconic straw boater 
and Cain just under a menu of possible options for response. And callers did love their little homuncular icons, but why within like 16 months or five sales quarters, the two mescent demand curve for video phony suddenly collapsed like a caked tent. So that... By the year of the Depend adult undergarment, fewer than 10% of all private telephone communications utilized any video image fiber data transfers or coincident products and services, the average U.S. phone user deciding that she, he, actually preferred the retrograde old low-tech Bell era voice-only telephonic interface after all a preferential about-face that caused a good many precipitant video telephony Related entrepreneurs, their shirts plus destabilizing two highly respected mutual funds that had ground floored heavily in video phone technology and very nearly wiping out the Maryland State Employees Retirement System's Freddie Mac Fund, a fund whose administrator's mistress brother had been an almost magically precipitant video phone technology entrepreneur, and but so why the abrupt consumer retreat back to good old voice only telephoning? The answer, in a kind of trivalent nutshell, is one, emotional stress, two, physical vanity, three, a certain queer kind of self-obliterating logic in the microeconomics of consumer high-tech. One, it turned out that there was something terribly stressful about video telephone interfaces that hadn't been stressful at all about voice-only interfaces. Video phone consumers seemed suddenly to realize that they'd been subject to an insidious but wholly marvelous delusion about conventional voice-only telephony. They never noticed it before. The delusion, it's like it was so emotionally complex that it could be countenanced only in the context of its loss. Good old traditional audio-only phone conversations allowed you to presume that the person on the other end was paying complete attention to you, while also permitting you not to have to pay anything even close to complete attention to her. A traditional oral-only conversation utilizing a handheld phone whose earpiece contained only six little pinholes, but whose mouthpiece, rather significantly, it seemed, contained six squared or 36 little pinholes let you enter a kind of highway hypnotic semi-attentive fugue while conversing you could look around the room doodle find groom peel tiny bits of dead skin away from your cuticles compose phone pad haiku stir things on the stove you could even carry on a whole separate additional sign language an exaggerated facial expression type of conversation with people right there in the room with you, all while seeming to be right there attending closely to the voice on the phone. And yet, and this was the retrospectively marvelous part, even as you were dividing your attention between the phone call and all sorts of other idle little fugue-like activities, you were somehow never haunted by the suspicion that the person on the other end's attention was similarly divided. During a traditional call, e.g., as you, let's say, performed a close, tactile blemish scan of your chin, you were in no way oppressed by the thought that your phone mate was perhaps also devoting a good percentage of her attention to a close, tactile blemish scan. It was an illusion, and the illusion was oral and orally supported. The phone line's other end's voice was dense, tightly compressed, and vectored right into your ear, enabling you to imagine that the voice's owner's attention was similarly compressed and focused, even though your own attention was not. Was the thing. This bilateral illusion of unilateral attention was almost infantilely gratifying from an emotional standpoint. You got to believe you were receiving somebody's complete attention without having to return it. Regarded with the objectivity of hindsight, the illusion appears irrational, almost literally fantastic. It would be like being both able to lie and to trust other people at the same time. Video telephony rendered the fantasy insupportable. Callers now found they had to compose the same sort of earnest, slightly over-intense listener's expression they had to compose for in-person exchanges. 
Those scholars who, out of unconscious habits, succumbed to fugue-like doodling or pants-creasing adjustment now came off looking rude, absent-minded, or childishly self-absorbed. Callers who even more unconsciously blemish-scanned or nostril-explored looked up to find horrified expressions on the video faces at the other end, all of which resulted in videophonic stress. Even worse, of course, was the traumatic expulsion from Eden feeling of looking up from tracing your thumb's outline on the reminder pad or adjusting the old unit's angle of repose in your shorts and actually seeing your videophonic interfacee idly strip a shoelace of its gumlet as she talked to you and suddenly realizing your whole infantile fantasy of commanding your partner's attention while you yourself got to fugue doodle and make little genital adjustments was deluded and insupportable, and that you were actually commanding not one bit more attention than you were paying here. The whole attention business was monstrously stressful, video callers found. Two, and the videophonic stress was even worse if you were at all vain, i.e., if you were worried at all about how you looked, as in to other people, which, all kidding aside, who doesn't? Good old oral telephone calls could be fielded without makeup, toupee, surgical prostheses, etc., even without clothes if that sort of thing rattled your saber. But, for the image conscious, there was of course no such answer as you are in formality about visual video telephone calls which consumers began to see were less like having the good old phone ring than having the doorbell ring and having to throw on clothes and attach prostheses and do hair checks in the foyer mirror before answering the door. But the real coffin nail for videophoning involved the way callers' faces looked on their TP screen during calls. Not their callers' faces, but their own When they saw them on video, it was a three-button affair, after all, to use the TP's cartridge card's video record option to record both pulses in a two-way visual call and play the call back and see how your face had actually looked to the other person during the call. This sort of appearance check was no more resistible than a mirror, but the experience proved almost universally horrifying. People were horrified at how their own faces appeared on a TP screen. It wasn't just Anchorman's bloat, that well-known impression of extra weight that video inflicts on the face. It was worse. Even with high-end TPs, high-definition viewer screens, consumers perceived something essentially blurred and moist-looking about their phone faces, a shiny, pallid indefiniteness that struck them as not just unflattering, but somehow evasive, furtive, untrustworthy, unlikable. In an early and ominous interlaced GTE focus group survey that was all but ignored in a storm of entrepreneurial sci-fi tech enthusiasm, almost 60% of respondents who received visual access to their own faces during videophonic calls specifically used the terms untrustworthy, unlikable, or hard to like. In describing their own visage's appearance, with a phenomenally ominous 71% of senior citizen respondents specifically comparing their video faces to that of Richard Nixon during the Nixon-Kennedy debates of BS 1960. The proposed solution to what the telecommunications industry's psychological consultants termed video physiognomic dysphoria, or VPD, was of course the advent of high-definition masking. And, in fact, it was those entrepreneurs who gravitated toward the production of high-definition videophonic imaging and then outright masks who got in and out of the short-lived videophonic era with their shirts plus solid additional nets. Mask-wise, the initial option of high-definition photographic imaging, i.e. taking the most flattering elements of a variety of flattering multi-angle photos of a given phone consumer and, thanks to existing image configuration equipment already pioneered by the cosmetics and law enforcement industries, combining them into a wildly attractive high-definition broadcastable composite of a face wearing an earnest, slightly over-intense expression of complete attention. 
was quickly supplanted by the more inexpensive and bite economical option of using the exact same cosmetic and FBI software, actually casting the enhanced facial image in a form-fitting polybutylene resin mask. And consumers soon found that the high upfront cost of a permanent wearable mask was more than worth it, considering the stress and VPD reduction benefits and the convenient Velcro straps for the back of the mask and collars' heads got peanuts. And for a couple fiscal quarters, phone cable companies were able to rally VPD-afflicted consumers' confidence by working out a horizontally integrated deal where free composite and masking services came with a video phone hookup. The high-def masks were not in use, simply hung on a small hook on the side of a TP's phone council. Admittedly looking maybe a bit surreal and discomforting when detached and hanging there empty and wrinkled, and sometimes they were potentially awkward mistaken identity snafus involving multi-user family or company phones, and the hurried selection and attachment of the wrong mask taken from some long row of empty hanging masks, but... All in all, the mask seemed initially like a viable industry response to the vanity, stress, and Nixonian facial image problem. Two, and maybe also three, but combining the natural entrepreneurial instinct to satisfy all sufficiently high consumer demand on the one hand, with what appears to be an almost equally natural distortion in the way persons tend to see themselves, and it becomes impossible to account historically for the speed with which the whole high-def videophonic mask thing spiraled totally out of control. Not only is it weirdly hard to evaluate what you yourself look like, like whether you're good-looking or not, e.g. try looking in the mirror and determining where you stand in the attractiveness hierarchy, with anything like the objective ease, you can determine whether just about anyone else you know is good-looking or not. But it turned out that consumers instinctively skewed self-perception. Plus, vanity-related stress meant that they began preferring and then outright demanding videophone masks that were really quite a lot better looking than they themselves were in person. High-def mask entrepreneurs, ready and willing to supply not just verisimilitude, but aesthetic enhancement, stronger chins, smaller eye bags, airbrushed scars and wrinkles, soon pushed the original mimetic mask entrepreneurs right out of the market. In a gradually unsubtilizing progression, within a couple more sales quarters, most consumers were now using masks so undeniably better looking on video phones than their real faces were in person, transmitting to one another such horrendously skewed and enhanced masked images of themselves, that enormous psychosocial stress began to result. Large numbers of phone users suddenly reluctant to leave home and interface personally with people who, they feared, were now habituated to seeing their far better looking masked selves on the phone and would, on seeing them in person, suffer. So went the caller's phobia, the same illusion-shattering aesthetic disappointment that, e.g., certain women who always wear makeup give people the first time they ever see them without makeup. The social anxieties surrounding the phenomenon psych consultants termed optimistically misrepresentational masking, or OMM, intensified steadily as the tiny crude first-generation videophone camera's technology improved to where the aperture wasn't as narrow, and now the higher-end tiny cameras could countenance and transmit more or less full-body images. Certain psychologically unscrupulous entrepreneurs began marketing full-body polybutylene and urethane 2D cutouts, sort of like the headless muscle man and bathing beauty cutouts you could stand behind and position your chin on the cardboard neck stump of for cheap photos at the beach. Only these full-body video phone masks were vastly more high-tech and convincing-looking. Once you added variable 2D wardrobe, hair, and eye color options, various aesthetic enlargements and reductions, etc., costs started to press the envelope of mass market affordability, even though there was at the same time horrific social pressure to be able to afford the very best possible mass 2D body image to keep from feeling comparatively hideous looking on the phone. 
How long, then, could one expect it to have been before the relentless entrepreneurial drive toward an ever better mousetrap conceived of the transmittable tableau, a.k.a. T.T., which, in retrospect, was probably the really sharp business end of the videophonic coffin nail. With T.T.'s, facial and bodily masking could now be dispensed with altogether and replaced with the video-transmitted image of what was essentially a heavily doctored still photograph, one of an incredibly fit and attractive and well-turned-out human being. Someone who actually resembled you, the caller, only in such limited respects as, like, race and limb number, the photo's face focused attentively in the direction of the videophonic camera from amid the sumptuous but not ostentatious appointments of the sort of room that best reflected the image of yourself you wanted to transmit, etc. The tableaus were simply high-quality transmission-ready photographs, scaled down to diorama-like proportions and fitted with a plastic holder over the video camera phone, not unlike a lens cap. Extremely good-looking, but not terrifically successful entertainment celebrities, the same sort who in decades past would have swelled the cast lists of infomercials, found themselves in demand as models for various high-end videophone tableaus. Because they involved simple transmission-ready photography, instead of computer imaging and enhancement, the tableaus could be mass-produced and commensurately priced. And for a brief time, they helped ease the tension between the high cost of enhanced body masking and the monstrous aesthetic pressures videophony exerted on callers, not to mention also providing employment for set designers, photographers, airbrushers, and infomercial-level celebrities hard-pressed by the declining fortunes of broadcast television advertising. Three. But there's some sort of revealing lesson here in the beyond short-term viability curve of advances in consumer technology. The career of videophony conforms neatly to this curve's classically annular shape. First, there's some sort of terrific sci-fi-like advance in consumer tech, like from oral to videophoning, which advance always, however, has certain unforeseen disadvantages for the consumer. And then, but the market niches created by those disadvantages, like people's stressfully vain repulsion at their own videophonic appearance, are ingeniously filled via sheer entrepreneurial verve. And yet the very advantages of these ingenious disadvantage compensations seem all too often to undercut the original high-tech advance, resulting in consumer recidivism and curve closure and massive shirt loss for precipitant investors. In the present case, the stress and vanity compensation's own evolution saw video callers rejecting first their own faces, and then even their own heavily masked and enhanced physical likenesses, and finally, covering the video cameras all together and transmitting attractively styled static tableaus to one another's TPs. And behind those lens cap dioramas and transmitted tableaus, callers, of course, found that they were once again stresslessly invisible, unvainly makeup and too paleless and baggy-eyed behind their celebrity dioramas, once again free, since, once again, unseen, to doodle, blemish scan, manicure, crease check. While on their screen, the attractive, intensely attentive face of the well-appointed celebrity on the other end's tableau reassured them that they were the objects of a concentrated attention they themselves didn't have to exert. And of course, but these advantages were nothing other than the once lost and now appreciated advantages of good old Bell era blind oral only telephoning with its six and six square pinholes. The only difference was that now these expensive, silly, unreal, stylized tableaus were being transmitted between TPs on high priced video fiber lines. How much time after this realization sank in and spread among consumers, mostly via phone, interestingly, would any microeconometrist expect to need to pass before high-tech visual videophony was mostly abandoned then? 
a return to good old telephoning, not only dictated by common consumer sense, but actually after a while culturally approved as a kind of chic integrity. Not Luddism, but a kind of retrograde transcendence of sci-fi-ish high-tech for its own sake a transcendence of the vanity and the slavery to high-tech fashion that people view as so unattractive in one another. In other words, a return to the oral-only telephony became, at the close curve's end, a kind of status symbol of anti-vanity, such that only callers utterly lacking in self-awareness continued to use videophony and tableaus to say nothing of masks and these tacky facsimile using people became ironic cultural symbols of tacky vain slavery to corporate PR and high-tech novelty. They became the subsidized era's tacky equivalents of people with leisure suits, black velvet paintings, sweater vests for their poodles, electric zirconium jewelry, no-coat lingua scrapers, and circa. Most communications consumers put their tableaus, dioramas, at the back of a knick-knack shelf and covered their cameras with standard black lens caps and now use their phone consoles, little mask hooks, to hang these new little plasticine address and phone diaries, specially made with little receptacle at the top of the binding for convenient hanging from former mask hooks. Even then, of course, the bulk of U.S. consumers remained verifiably reluctant to leave home and teleputer, and to interface personally, though this phenomenon's endurance can't be attributed to the videophony fat per se, and anyway, the new panagraphobia served to open huge new entrepreneurial teleputerized markets for home shopping and delivery, and didn't cause much industry concern.